OK, so good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the July OREF meeting. Um, I'm uh, Neil Kermode. I'm one of the joint chairs of OREF. And uh, this evening we've got a session um, by uh, with Pete Oswald and Jörn McTurk and a little bit from me about some work that was done, um, which really is about uh, what we know about batteries. So I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully I'm going to get the right one. Um, if somebody could confirm you're seeing a, uh, a slide showing what we know about batteries. Somebody must be there. Looks somebody good. There? Yes, fantastic. That's a relief. Just sitting here talking to myself for 20 minutes. It's really embarrassing. Um, so uh, I use that slide particularly because it uh, shows when we spe spelt out our no CO2 ex exclamation mark message, which we sent to the um, Earth Summit back in 2017. And the point is that we've been tinkering around with cars for quite some time. And this, um, I think, shows something of our, our provenance. And the point is that we actually know well, we wanted to know what we knew about batteries and, and the session this evening is going to look at a piece of work that we have done, first of all, locally um, in terms of trying to understand how EV batteries behave. And then we're going to hand over to Ewan, who, who is an expert electro electrochemist and uh, will give a full introduction uh, to himself, um, but is a, a world expert on some of the mechanics in the, in the battery side of things. And I'm having seen a couple of his presentations and seen his uh, online chats, I think it's going to be extremely interesting. So first of all, a few little moments from me. Um, we've been, as you know, we've had EVs here in Orkney over a number of years, and this graph shows the number of EVs registered going back from 2013 through to 2019, and we broke through the 250 mark um, in 2019. These figures are always um, a few months uh, late because they come from government statistics, and we're probably now easing up towards the 300 mark we expect at the moment. And when we, we run a database of how people are getting on with their cars and every month uh, EV drivers are asked to submit their mileages and um, we've got about 70 or so cars I think it is on the database at the moment and those cars send in uh, monthly mileages of, of what they're doing and also how they're doing. Are they having problems and are the aren't many faults it's usually things like wiper blades or hitting um uh, hitting dogs in the road which is what i managed to wrap the front of the car off anyway um the other thing we do know from the database is actually the types of vehicles and the quick analysis shows that the vast majority of vehicles on the database are missing leaves um which is uh, what i also drive so there was a degree of self-interest there to try and find out about the batteries and the cars and particularly the Nissan Leafs and the big question that was always asked or was certainly asked back then was do these things actually last are they just um, going to be something that's going to go for a while and oh the batteries won't last or the you know the clocks and defense um, so the, the so we thought well can we do some tracking and find out how we get on with the vehicles, not just in how far they travel, um, which is quite uh, telling because we know from the mileages people put in, these are the averages mile, the average mileages people travel uh, per day in a month. Um, and, sh and that's a pretty uniform picture that we see. But we also wanted to know how are the batteries actually doing over time? Um, how do they um, how do they perform now and how is that going to change over time? How are we going to, what changes could we expect to see manifest? And the point is when we started this back in uh, 2017, we didn't have evidence like we've just had from SOS office supplies of their 100,000 miles on their EV van, which happened um, in early June. And there's an excellent video by Jonathan Porterfield um, on the EV uh, website I urge you to look at. Um, so we thought, how can we find out about how these cars are doing? We thought, well, let's work on crowdsourced knowledge because OREF is very good at that and reaching out to the membership. And as a result of that, we found that there was a piece of software that we could load, a thing called LeafSpy. LeafSpy is a cost about, or well, LeafSpy Pro is about a tenner, um, getting from all Google's, all Android stores and all that guff. Um, and in effect, it allows you to interface with your car by using a small plug-in unit called an ODB converter, which plugs into the uh, a port that's on the front of the car. 
or under the under the steering wheel in a variety of different locations depending on the model of the car so we advertised and said we're going to have a session and we picked a bloody cold day in january um when we got people together uh, back in 2018 this would be for the first time we then re-ran exactly the same event in 2019 and we ran it again in 2019 uh, 2020 but ran it in uh, a bit later on when the weather was supposed to be better it wasn't uh, so basically plugged in the converter to the cars downloaded some um, information from the cars nothing was uploaded to the cars just downloaded and that involved uh, we, we then basically took screenshots so the information we could get looks like looks as follows these are screenshots of my car uh, Nissan Leaf a 24 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf that was taken basically a year apart between each of those so spanning a two-year period and that gave us three data points which you thought well might tell us something um it shows the number of slow charges that the car has had which is here on the right hand side above the 12 uh, figure the 533 here 1700 uh, 1978 and 3127 I'm not necessarily sure I believe all these numbers because that's a hell of a lot in a year um, that's about four a day so there's something not quite right there um, also the number of rapid charges I did 10 in that year and I did about 30 in the following it also shows the mileage of the car the odometer reading in each of the uh, various years um, and it also allows us to see some differences and so looking at different cars in the same year we got something like this so interesting pictures but what does it all mean and this is where pete really comes in because pete did has done some extra analysis and i'm going to hand over to him because he has derived some really interesting information which is far beyond my my abilities so uh jen if you can take back control uh, well I'll, I'll knock off screen save hand over to pete <coughs> thank you neil uh good evening everybody um many of you might know me um pete oswald uh, engineer by background. Um, I've got about six more slides uh, in this pack to show you, and the presentations are going to take about 15 minutes. Um, Neil, as he said, asked me to have a look at this uh, data that's been collected um, and really to see if we can see any trends. Um, the, I'll do the presentation for 15 minutes or so, then you and will do his. I'm going to take a break, and then after the break, we can have a discussion, ask some questions. I think a big thanks to everyone who contributed to the surveys. Uh, this is uh, Real Citizen Science in Action. Jennifer, please, the next slide. Okay, <clears throat> so what is this data set? So a little discussion about what we have here. They, as Neil said, the leaf spies the phone app which interrogates the Nissan battery uh, management system. Uh, it should not be considered an absolute reading. Uh, there are mistakes. You can see mistakes coming through. Uh, but I guess it does its best. The data set is actually a relatively small data set. It's only got 64 uh, points in its readings, I guess, uh, on the Orkney uh, EV cohorts. but. It's very important and it's what we've got and we can gather quite a bit of information out of this. I'm actually now gathering other random leaf spy data. So I've got a filter that I can filter the Orkney ones and uh, the uh, non Orkney ones. All the data tonight is going to be the Orkney cohort. Uh, the data has been collected on a voluntary basis, but it's actually a bit random who turns up. So some uh, cars are in once, some cars are in three times. Uh, the Neil and uh, Jonathan who's collecting this has been very good and kept all the screen dumps. So I've been able to go back through the um, uh, screen dumps and verify all the data, just the QA, the database, make sure it's tight. However, uh, there was no screen dumps of the seconds that were taken for each of the captures. So there's a little bit of a question mark there. What was the settings of the leaf spy? correctly uh, uh, done, so model number, uh, battery size. Uh, particularly on the ENV 200s, uh, if you don't put the right information in on the uh, menu there, 
you will get a wrong reading for the EMD 200s. And I'll come back to that later on. In the presentation, there are going to be three terminologies used. Uh, the first one is SOH, which is the state of health, which is viewed as the overall battery condition. It's something that uh, Nissan uh, has uh, um, developed. Miles, obviously the distance picked up on the odometer and it's backed up with the leaf spy. And the percent rapid. The percent rapid is a calculated number by myself out of the data. And it's essentially the number of rapids divided by the number of rapids plus the level ones and level twos. In other words, the number of rapids over the total charges represented as a percentage. Um, when I plotted out the data, I could see several patterns um, relating to different leaf models. So I'm going to walk through in the next slides uh, how each of the leaf models uh, come out in the data. Jennifer, please. So this uh, first uh, slide is on the Japanese manufactured leaves. So in the bin number, you see a JN1. The leaf spy is able to give you the bin number so you can interrogate from the open source database uh, where things are, you know, what's the manufacturer, what's he done in the, uh, in the car manufacturing. Along the x-axis, uh, at the bottom, we have distance in miles. And on the y-axis, we have the state of health from the leaf spy. I've added a trend line there. It could be argued that that trend line could be moved in various different angles and moved up and moved down. But I think everybody can agree that there is a, a downward trend uh, there as the car does more miles, the state of health uh, slowly degrades. It could be argued at the top that the trend line goes to over 100%. And we have seen this, that some of the younger leaves uh, with few miles, that you do get states of health above 100%. And you'll see that in the other presentation here. But equally, we could have anchored uh, that trend line on the 100%. The bubble size is the amount of rapid charging that has been done. It's a percentage of the rapid charge. So where you see small circle, there's been very little rapid charges. It's essentially all been level one and level two. I can't tell the rate of the level one and level two. Was it at six, six amps or 16 amps? Can't tell. But uh, what you can tell is uh, the percentage of the rapids. And you can see that I've highlighted uh, two uh, points that are off trend uh, associated with very low uh, rapids. We'll come back to this. Next slide, please. Pete, we've lost your sound. I think you might have muted yourself accidentally. Yeah, Thanks, did. that's great. Okay, right. that. okay, this is the uh, Z0 leaf. Uh, this is the ZE within the VIN numbers. The state of uh, health decline is less than the older JN1 uh, models. Um, and I've, again, I've taken an approximate uh, trend uh, that you can see as the going miles, the uh, state of health slowly comes down. However, there's something that's happening around about 5,000 miles. And you can see that there's a leveling out of the trend, that uh, you've got cars up at 70,000 miles, that um, state of health is still up at 95, 96, 97%. There's some cars there that have got 40, 50,000 miles that have got low rapid charge and their state of health is still over 100%. So what's really going on here? Um, is, it, is it purely down to the rapid charges, the lack of rapid charges, or 
there's something else maybe is going on. And we'll come back to this. Next slide, please. This is the Z1 leaves. Uh, the, so it's ZE1 within the VIN number. The later model. Um, and again, the, the plot has been the same. And I've put, attempted to put a trend line in. Trend line more or less goes to the 100%. Again, you can see uh, that as with miles, uh, you, you're getting a, a slower decrease in uh, state of uh, health performance. Um, but we don't have any real data uh, beyond 40,000 miles. So it's, it's too early to tell from this data is if we're going to have a leveling out as we see in the Z0 uh, models uh, that it goes, goes uh, flatter. However, there's an interesting one up uh, there at 5,000 miles, where uh, there's one vehicle that has got very little rapid charges, and it's almost lost uh, no uh, state of health. Next slide, please. For completeness, I've put the ENV 200s on the slide. Uh, these are the Spanish-built uh, wagons, um, and uh, whether they're a van uh, or whether they're a combi, um, I haven't dis differentiated. Uh, also, there are various models in here. There's uh, 24 kil kilowatt hours, and there's also 40 kilowatt hours. Very little data, uh, and so we've got to use great caution in, in looking at this, but I put in through the slides, really mainly for com, uh, completeness. I actually have uh, an EMD 200, so this is of particular interest uh, to me. And I'm actually doing a long-term, uh, almost daily uh, reading of the EMD over the lockdown period as I do different charging regimes to see how it's behaving. Uh, it's interesting, uh, that SOS van that was mentioned, you know, it was up at 100,000 miles, so off the chart, it was around about 85%. So it's kind of uh, on trend. It may have actually followed more the Z0 uh, trend uh, rather than the EMD trend, but it's, it's nevertheless, it's, it's in, in that area. So what's all this telling us? So if we go to the next slide for the discussion, so the key thing from the data that each Nissan model leaf appears to have battery packs and management systems which are performing differently. Some leaves start at over 100% state of health, but it looks like the later battery models are showing better performance than the older ones. Some battery packs will, of course, perform better than other ones with the same conditions. It's just a normal manufacturing uh, um, you know, variance that you get. And this is why we continue to need a lot more data because more data we get uh, on the EEDs, the more we can actually see uh, varying conditions, uh, uh, varying performance with the same conditions. The data is on long-term performance. Uh, Short-term changes can't be, cannot be analyzed. I know and uh, myself, and I've had anecdotal information to say, you know, I got an EV and I did some two rapid charges and the state of health came up and battery overall performance improved. That may be so, and maybe Ewan can uh, show some insight to that in his presentation. We can't see that level of fidelity within this data. Remember, this has been sampled once a year on, um, on a variable number of cars. The SOH, uh, the state of health decline against miles appears to decrease with low percent rapid charges. But I think there's something else going on here. And really, there's insufficient data to completely prove this. Um, but I think we need to look at it. And hopefully, Ewan is going to back some of this up in his presentation later on. But when I've gone in and analyzed specifically some high-performing EVs with regarding 
uh, maintaining the state of health. These tend to have high daily miles and slow charging. And so therefore, when you look at the battery and how the state of charge, in other words, how full the battery is, most of the day, the battery is sitting between 50 and 80%. So slow charging comes home at night, maybe 40%, 30%, uh, comes home, goes on to a slow charge, maybe never gets to 100% until maybe 5 o'clock in the morning, and then at some 8 o'clock in the morning, it's getting used to go into turtle again, and it's back down to 75%. And so uh, there's, there's a clue here that's going on in the data to say that what we really need to be doing, it's maybe not so much the rapid charging per se, uh, I think it's more about maintaining your battery of your car within the optimum period wherever you, you can. And I think this is important as the batteries are getting bigger with the cars, the mileage. Because if you imagine with a, a car that can do, say, um, you know, 200 miles, and you're only doing 25 miles a day average, that's 12 and a half, and you're charging it every night, you'd be lucky that the battery ever gets below 90%. So I think what we're starting to see, and we need more data to confirm this, that what we really need to be doing is with uh, these cars is to be managing our state of charge to be between 50 and 80%, wherever practical. I encourage everybody to get a Leaf Spy, as Neil said, they're cheap, easy to use. Uh, Take off screen dumps, uh, the important two screen dumps uh, are uh, dump number one, screen number one, and I've shown the symbols, what it looks like on the, on the leaf spy, and screen number three, uh, that gives the GIDs and some uh, capacity information that we're looking at. I would love to get a, a post-lockdown survey, and uh, part of that post-lockdown survey, I think what we really need to start looking at is uh, almost an interview to determine how you charge your car. How often do you keep your car between this sort of 50 and 80%? And so that's where I would like to aim for in the, in the next survey, is to examine uh, how to optimize and keep your battery healthy. Thank you for listening. Pete, thanks very much indeed for that. Um, uh, I should have been listening more closely as to whether we were going to take questions now or going to. I think we're going to go on to you and next, and then take questions after that. Was that the plan? Yeah, uh, after the break, we'll, uh, we'll yeah. take all the questions. If that's okay. Um, for your interest, I have in the chat function uh, posted uh, just a quick uh, Google search for um, the, the converters, which I found for £9.61 each, and the Leafs by our software is between 10 and 12 quid, I think, as in your usual um, providers. So anyway, if you want to, uh, do feel free to get in touch with us after this and happily uh, chat about that later. Pete, are you going to come in there? Yes, and Neil, maybe one thing, just on the ODB adapter, uh, there, there's a recommendation for a specific o, uh, adapter now. Uh, some of the ODB adapters won't handle the new, uh, so be careful. Which Fine. Adapter you, you use. It's the okay. Conway, C-O-N-W-E-I. But the We're, Leaf Spy is very clear. Uh, the new Leaf Spies are very clear for adapters to use. OK, so probably ignore my earlier link on that then. But anyway, see, see here we go. Right, so I am now going to hand over to Ewan. Um, uh, I didn't come to the rehearsal, so um, I don't know with Jen, are you sharing or is Ewan taking control? So I'll hand, I'll step back. No worries, you, Ewan's going to manage this one. So Ewan, do you, you're happy to do uh, an intro to yourself and do feel free to plug plug life, if you see what I mean. Good evening. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, cheers. Um, thank you for having us uh, for this forum. Uh, apologies for being unable to make it in person. Obviously, world events have rather got in the way. But um, yeah, it's been a very intriguing evening so far. It's good to see that you've been gathering data with uh, Leaf Spy, which is definitely the best 12 quid I've ever spent. It's an incredibly powerful app. Um, and actually, uh, it's not only good enough for this study, but I've used it to gather drive cycles off of my own leaf that I've then used to test batteries in the lab. So, um, you know, for doing drive cycle simulation and so on. So 
for pocket money, it is a really good uh, a really good app. So, can everyone see my screen? First and foremost, should be able to yeah. see yes. the PowerPoint. Yes. Excellent. Okay. So let's delve a little bit into what these figures that Pete has presented actually mean. First, a little bit about me for anyone who doesn't know. So I'm Dr. Ewan McTurk. I'm an electrochemist, uh, started off doing an applied physics degree called Renewable Energy at the University of Dundee in 2006, um, where I first stumbled across EVs and battery tech and uh, did my honours and master's project on them. Conveniently, one of the leading next generation battery research groups in the world. It was right across the Tay in St. Andrews. So I did my PhD there. They relocated to Oxford. So I did my, uh, well, continued my PhD, which became rebranded a DPhil in material science, uh, where I started working not just on new battery technology, such as lithium air, which is a breathing battery that has more in common with a fuel cell than a conventional lithium ion battery. But I also started instrumenting commercial lithium ion cells, the likes of um, what you would find in, in EVs, uh, actually putting probes in them to find out just how hard we can push these things because they are a black box system. So this was allowing us to see what was really going on inside them, uh, push them as hard as we could with minimum degradation. I continued that trend at WNG, University of Warwick, a huge automotive and particularly electric vehicle and battery research facility at University of Warwick, uh, fully charged. I've done an episode on them. I'd highly recommend checking it out. And I'm now the electrochemist at Ducosi in Edinburgh, where I'm heading up their battery research lab. Ducosi uh, are developing a very clever new battery management system that's wireless and data rich and has a host of different advantages. And yes, I'm the creator of Plug Life Television. So, yeah, there's been a bit of concern or, or um, you know, just in the back of the mind of EV drivers that when it comes to charging your electric vehicle, do you kind of stop short of 100% to protect the battery or do you go all the way? Does that actually cause any damage? Uh, and then also people are worried about the impact of rapid charging Does that really uh, degrade the vehicle's battery quicker. So this is what we're going to have a look at in a bit more detail today. Let's start with rapid charging. And first of all, rapid charging all the way to 100%. Is it worth your time? As any seasoned EV driver will know, um, this is you know, this presentation was initially designed for the kind of Mark One Nissan Leaf, but it's obviously it varies a little bit from EV to EV. But you'll generally get a really high power, up to about 80%, and then you'll see that start to taper off very quickly as you head towards 100% capacity and you do reach a crossover point where you're actually better off moving off the rapid charger onto an adjacent destination post so that that frees up the rapid charger for people who need to get to where they're going ASAP. Um, now, why does that happen? Why do we reach that point around about 80%? Certainly on the LEAF, it's, it's later on, for example, the Mark I Ionic, it's earlier on the Mark II Ionic. Uh, those are just some examples. But what's happening is, you know, you've got your maximum current uh, going in uh, that the, the rapid charger can, can cope with uh, up until the individual cell voltages reach their maximum voltage. And if you go beyond that, you're going to cause irreversible damage to the cells. So given that power is current times voltage, the only way to stop the cell from being overcharged uh, or the cells within the pack from being overcharged is to throttle back the current. That's when we start to see the power as a whole tapering off because you're holding the cells at Vmax. The current will taper off to a uh, a predetermined minimum threshold, at which point the charge is deemed complete. And what you'll typically see for earlier EVs is that you'll take about half an hour to get from zero to 80 and another half an hour to get from 80 to 100. So rapid charging to 100% is not only um, not necessarily uh, a smart move in terms of battery health, but it's also just not worth anyone's time. And of course, plug-in hybrids can't even rapid charge, so they shouldn't really be anywhere near a rapid charger to begin with. And I am going to include the Outlander in it, despite that has, the fact that it has a channel port, it's very slow at rapid charging. So does rapid charging damage your electric vehicle's battery? Um, actually, what we found so far is that rapid charging to sort of 80% or so, you know, typical rapid charging uh, behavior, is that EV batteries are surprisingly resilient. Certainly modern EV batteries, later generation EV batteries, are surprisingly resilient to rapid charging. Um, and a lot of the key of that is thermal management. Now, interestingly, the vehicles that we've just looked at, the Nissan Leaf, does not have active thermal management. But, um, you know, you look at your, 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 your Teslas, your Renault Zoe's, your Hyundai Ionics, uh, Kia, um, 
Kia Souls and E-Neuros and so on, and they tend to be quite resilient to rapid charging. But there's been a really interesting study quite recently that showed that um, the state of health, which can be defined as the capacity of the battery today versus when it was brand new, that degradation is actually minimal if EV batteries are allowed to get hot during rapid charging, because getting hot means that the lower uh, the, the internal resistance is lowered, which means that the, uh, the, the maximum voltage isn't reached quite as quickly because there's less resistance uh, and V is IR. So that means you get faster rapid charging because you're not hitting the maximum voltage as quickly as you would otherwise. And the kinetics, the ability of the lithium ions to move within the cell are significantly increased. So that actually is okay to allow the battery to get hot during rapid charging as long as the heat is removed immediately afterwards. So you're charging up your cell to 100%. It gets really hot. As soon as it reaches the end of the charge, switch on your thermal management, extract that heat as quick as you can. And we've already seen this actually uh, in operation because Tesla have uh, recently, quite recently, configured their vehicles to preheat the battery pack to 50 degrees C if a supercharger is programmed into the sat-nav as the next destination. So it conditions the battery to be able to absorb as much power as quickly as possible. Long-term exposure to temperatures of 50 degrees C or more, and in fact, well, probably mid-30s degrees C or more, will cause enhanced degradation, uh, increased degradation of the battery's state of health. But just doing it over that short period of time actually helps things along a bit and it doesn't really impact on the state of health. Now, the leaf is an interesting one because we've heard all sorts of uh, fables about um, rapid charging miraculously improving the state of health reading on a leaf spy output. Um, so as I said before, state of health is capacity day, today versus capacity when you does rapid charging somehow improve the chemistry? Does it revitalize it? To be honest, you cannot really tell the true capacity of an electric vehicle's battery pack unless you fully charge the car and then run it completely flat and then get, <laughs> you know, you need to get flat bedded to a charge point afterwards. Um, that's the only way you can measure the true capacity of the battery. And in fact, truth be told, there's more to it than that, which I'll cover on the next slide. So the state of health algorithm, because you're never, all, well, you might charge it to 100% most of the time, but you're never running it down to 0%. So the, the algorithm that's trying to determine, or it's, it's not measuring the state of health, it's, it's guessing it. It's, a, it's an educated guess. And the LEAF's state of health algorithm is notoriously sensitive to two things. One of them is ambient temperature. If it's colder outside, the state of health is shown as being higher. A good example of this, my own LEAF, which um, I, I got in the summer of 2017, uh, when I took delivery of it, it had a, an SOH reading on leaf spy of 92%. The following winter was the beast from the east, bitterly, bitterly cold winter. And in February 2018, the state of health reading was 102%. So I'd put on tens of thousands of miles on it, and allegedly the capacity had increased by 10%. Uh, the other thing that it's, this algorithm is sensitive to is charging power. The higher the power, the higher the reported state of health. Now, this points towards something which uh, Jonathan Porterfield from Orkney's very own EcoCars has noticed when procuring LEAFs at auction. Uh, LEAFs that have a 3.3 kilowatt onboard charger routinely show for the same kind of mileage, the same kind of treatment, a lower state of health than LEAFs that have a 6.6 .6 kilowatt onboard charger because the 6.6 .6 is charged quicker and the state of health algorithm goes, oh, okay, must be higher SOH. Whereas the 3.3 physically cannot charge anywhere near as fast unless it's on a rapid charger. And that also explains why rapid charging leaf miraculously revives the SOH. Take that with a pinch of salt. That's not really true. In terms of the, the SOH number um, that's given on leaf spy, don't let that kind of wishy-washy number completely dominate your life. As long as you're still getting sufficient range from your EV, enjoy it. Um, but, you know, do do obviously try to look after the battery uh, by following best practice as much as possible. Now, I'll, I'll cover that in a minute, but I did say there was more to the story about the true capacity of an electric vehicle's battery pack, and that is the state of charge buffers. What is reported as 100% on the dashboard is not actually the case. What you have here 
is the upper state of charge buffer and the lower state of charge buffer. So the, the vehicle or the battery management system, the electronics that look after the battery has deliberately blocked off the high and the low end of the capacity so that you can't use it. And that helps to extend the battery's life in the following way. So for the upper SOC buffer, you're preventing degradation due to the cell being held at a very high state of charge, which in turn means it's being held at a very high voltage. The voltage of a lithium ion cell or, or of any battery is the potential difference of that cell. It is the difference in the potential between the positive electrode and the negative electrode. And as you are charging a lithium ion battery, the cathode, which is the positive terminal, the positive electrode, its potential increases up to, in the case of the Nissan Leaf battery and most EV batteries, about 4.2 volts. Whereas, this is versus lithium, I should say, whereas the anode, the negative electrode, decreases in potential down towards about zero volts versus lithium. And the electrolyte, that ionically conducting uh, fluid that helps the well that allows the lithium ions to traverse the inside of the cell between the positive and the negative electrode. That electrolyte is not stable when it's against a really high potential in the cathode, such as 100% state of charge. That will over time degrade, and that will decrease the state of health. That will decrease the capacity. It will it will it probably um, yeah you'll have higher internal resistance and so on. And then the lower state of charge buffer, that helps to prevent degradation due to over discharge. So if the car was left at a very low SOC for too long and there was parasitic drain of the electronics or just you know, over a very, very long time, the self discharge of the lithium ion battery itself, you would cause irreversible damage to a lithium ion battery because you would end up with the copper that is the current collector on the negative electrode, the anode, that copper is there to act as an interface between the active material, that's the, the graphite that the lithium ion is pigeonholed into, and the external circuit, the actual bit that you clip um, your wires onto on the outside of the cell. So that's allowing the electrons in and out. That shouldn't be taking part in the reaction, but it will start to leach and form little branch-like growths called dendrites, and that will cause an internal short circuit. It's not just lithium that causes dendrites. In certain conditions, if you over-discharge the cell below, say, 2.5 volts, that's typical 0%, for most lithium ion cells, you will end up with copper leaching out and that causes internal short circuits eventually. So that helps, you know, that lower SOC buffer helps to prevent that from happening. So what's reported as 100% on the dashboard on the leaf is actually nearer 97% in real life. That's not much of an SOC buffer, but it does help to prevent electrolyte degradation. One of the most extreme examples of SOC buffers in a commercial EV is the Chevy Volt or Vauxhall Ampera, which actually blocked off 20% of its top and bottom uh, battery capacity. So it only used 60% of its capacity. And as a result, you'll be hard pressed to find a Vauxhall Ampera or a Chevy Volt that has any noticeable degradation in its usable capacity. There's one in California that had racked up 400,000 miles and was still reporting 100% of its capacity. So another consideration is the need to balance the cells within a lithium ion battery pack. To begin with, the voltages will rise and fall as one. But then over time, what you'll notice is that some cells start to get out of whack and their voltage uh, or their state of charge, I should say, isn't quite 100% when the rest of the cells in the pack have hit their maximum voltage. So they, they cannot be charged any further unless you do something about it. And that just gets progressively worse over time. So there's a couple of things that you can do that will allow you to gradually bring the voltages to bring the capacity, you know, the, the state of charge, sorry, back in line with the rest of the cells to put them back in line with each other. There's two options. One of them is passive balancing. That's where you use bleed resistors to bleed off any excess charge from fully charged cells to stop the voltage from going too high, to stop them from being overcharged, whilst the rest of the cells are being gradually brought up to 100%. That's very inexpensive to do, but it is a bit wasteful because energy is wasted as heat. However, the vast majority, in fact, all EVs on the market do that because it's the cheap thing to do. The other thing you can do is active balancing, where you actually transfer charge from fully charged cells already, which would otherwise be overcharged with you know, feeding more current into them. It cleverly, through a bit of clever circuitry, feeds the cells that haven't been fully charged yet to bring them up to the same level. That's very efficient, but it also costs about 10 times as much to do, which is why it's not been done commercially today. 
So as a rule of thumb, when it comes to fully charging and balancing the battery, which is something you generally don't want to be doing routinely, as I'll explain in a minute, but you know, it's still good to, to keep the battery balanced, just not like every single time you plug it in. So my recommendation is depending on the size of the battery in your vehicle. If you've got an early Nissan Leaf, for example, 24 kilowatt hour pack, do that about once per week. If you've got a mid-sized EV battery like the Renault Zoe, um, the 40 or the 50, then do that once per fortnight. And if you've got a big Tesla or something, do it about once per month. There's a couple of caveats there. This um, advice is for cars that are in regular use, daily commuting, um, and it's also good practice if you're doing the full charge and balance to drive the car within a few hours of that charge completing so that the voltage isn't left at a, well the voltage of those cells isn't left at a high level you know the 100 percent for weeks on end or anything like that so that this is basically maximizing the care of your battery pack so what is the recommended procedure uh, what's the recommended kind of range to charge and discharge a battery to actually use your EV. In my case, with my 24 kilowatt hour Leaf, I was doing a 50 mile round trip commute every day. So I fully charged it, but then it was off the charger within a couple of hours of the charge completing. I drove it down to 40% and then plugged back in again. And if I was out and about, I would quite happily take it down to 20%. Obviously you can go down to zero if you really need it. But if I was, if I was passing a rapid charger, and um, I wasn't anywhere near my destination at the time, I would hop on at 20% rather than try and squeak to one that was at like 5% or 0% by the time I got to it. Um, and speaking of rapid charging for cross-country journeys, I would never charge above 80% on a rapid charger unless I absolutely needed the range and there were no alternative destination posts nearby because that is the most time efficient way to do it. And it's also kindest to the cells. Now, note that there's no balancing on a rapid charger, no matter how long you leave the car plugged in. So if you do not have uh, off-street parking, if you don't have your own charge point and you're routinely using rapid chargers, it would be quite good practice to stick your car on a destination charge point and let it fully charge and balance when you get the opportunity, uh, just to try and bring things back in line with each other. And uh, I've since uh, swapped for something a little bit bigger on battery and uh, physical dimensions. It's an unnecessarily big car, but then, then again, it's a Tesla. So I, I, was, I, I couldn't help myself. Anyway, so I've, I rarely take that above 80% because um, it's such a big battery that for that commute I was talking about, I simply don't need it. And it's got more than enough range for multiple days worth of driving before I need to plug it in. I'll take it down to about 30% before I plug it back in. And that is pretty kind to the cells. It's pretty kind to the, the chemistry. Uh, the one thing you do not want to do with any EV, absolutely do not do shallow, repeated shallow cycling at a high state of charge. So if you leave the car plugged in and you're constantly charging up to 100% and balancing it, leaving it like that for days, then just driving two miles down the shops and back and plugging in again. That is how you wreck an EV's battery. It is not recommended. And in fact, the 30 kilowatt hour Leaf is particularly prone to this mistreatment because it doesn't have the long life mode setting that the 24 kilowatt hour Leaf had. It will only charge up to 100% unless you physically unplug it. There's no way to... Uh, you know, to, to make it charge to a lesser amount and cut it off itself. Um, and I've seen numerous Leafs that have seen, or oh, 30 kilowatt hour Leafs that have had higher battery degradation, at surprisingly low mileage, because they're just always plugged in regardless of how long the journey was. Do not do that. That's how you kill them. And of course, battery care during periods of little or no use. This will be very relevant given what has been happening this year. The coronavirus lockdown is has really tested actually uh, people's um, sort of battery knowledge and battery care. Uh, because what happens, as I said before, if you leave the car fully charged for weeks or months on end, is you will gradually get that electrolyte degradation and that will be impacting on the health of the battery pack. So you ideally want to leave it in a range of between 50 and 80% SOC. This applies to the lockdown, it applies to going away on holiday, um, not by car, and uh, it applies to any other long periods of little or no use. Leave it between 80%, which is low enough to prevent uh, electrolyte degradation, 
and 50% is high enough to limit the chances of over discharge. Now, lithium ion batteries will only self discharge by about 2% per month maximum. So not much. However, in an electric vehicle, you've got the parasitic drain of all of the electronics. So that drain will be faster and therefore you want to keep an eye on it every so often. Um, to give you an idea of, of typical parasitic drain, uh, a Nissan Leaf may lose about 10 miles of range per month, but an older Tesla Model S that's not put into like a proper shutdown deep sleep, uh, the default is like a standby mode. So it's always got electronics ticking over. That can lose 10 miles of range a day. Tesla have improved this on later models, I'm told. But if you have an older, thirstier one, keep an eye on it during lockdown because it can discharge itself surprisingly quickly. So some EVs have the ability to adjust the maximum state of charge that it will charge to. Here's the slidey bar option on the Tesla app, for example. There are loads of EVs that offer that now. And in the case of the 24 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf, you go into the zero emission charging timer, edit schedule, and then you can put on long life mode 80%, save that. And that will make sure that your battery is nice and healthy during lockdown. Some EVs do not have that option. They will only charge up to 100%, like the 30 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf. So here's an example I've used. It's a 40 kilowatt hour Renault Zoe, currently at 33%. We want to get to 80% without, quote unquote, overcharging it above that, because um, we're going to be leaving the car for a long period of time. We have a home charger that's 7 kilowatts. And we've got an onboard charger that's 22 kilowatts. The charging will, of course, be limited by the lesser of these two, which is the home charger in this case at seven kilowatts. So how long do we need to leave the car plugged in for? The time to charge the car in hours is the required energy divided by the charging power. So you're looking at your target SOC minus your SOC at present. Divide that by 100, multiply that by the battery capacity and divide that by the charging power. It may look a bit scary, but let's talk through where we're getting all these from. So target SOC, 80%. The SOC we're at at the moment is 33. And then we've got a 40 kilowatt hour battery and the charging power is the home charger, seven kilowatts. So working through all of that, you've got 47% of 40 kilowatt hours, which is 18.8 .8 kilowatt hours. Divide that by seven and it's 2.7 hours or two hours and 42 minutes. That's how you work it out manually. That might be a bit uh, daunting for some. So I've, I've done something that was very daunting for me and tried to figure out how HTML works. Um, so if you go to pluglifetelevision.co.uk, uh, there is a, a battery lockdown battery top-up calculator where I have sliding bars that allow you to put in those variables I just mentioned, and it will tell you uh, in hours and minutes how long to leave the car plugged in for. So if you're doing this during lockdown or whilst you're away on holiday, um, that gives you an idea of very quickly an idea of, of how long to leave the car plugged in for. Um, now, there is a, a bit of a debate for, well, there was a bit of a debate during lockdown of whether to do a periodic top up of the battery or leave it plugged in. So do you unplug, wait on the battery or the car self discharging itself and then top up again? Now, that's something that uh, I prefer to do. That's my choice. I check via the apps at least once a week to make sure that the cars are okay. And if they're not, I'll plug them in. Technically, leaving it plugged in is fine if the 80% rule is adhered to. You don't charge above that. The battery management system should regulate the charging. But some EVs, and I don't have an exhaustive list of which, aren't smart enough to keep an eye on the auxiliary battery, the 12 volt battery, the lead acid battery that is in any car. This is typically charged when the traction battery is engaged. So, for example, uh, oh, there's an example on the leaf that shows you uh, how you know if the traction battery is engaged. You've got that little green ready light of the car you know, moving backwards or forwards. Now, some EVs, if you leave them plugged in, they'll top up the traction battery and the 12 volt, but then they won't keep an eye on the 12 volt after that. So if you've left it for months, um, the, if, particularly if it's an older 12 volt battery that's on the way out, it could self discharge and brick itself. Um, and then, you know, you would end up uh, unable to uh, to get the car to to do what you need it to. You need to you know fit a replacement 12 volt battery. So, um, yeah, that is a, a bit of a funny one. But I've heard of that being an issue before, even though the car was plugged in, the car forgot to look after the little 12 volt battery because it was too busy keeping an eye on the traction battery. However, if that car had been unplugged and plugged back in, that would have 
incentivized it. It would have prompted it to uh, check the voltage of the 12 volt battery and then top that up if needs be. So I recommend doing what I do, which is the periodic top up of unplug and then plug back in when necessary. So a couple of useful charts for you. Uh, battery care during periods of regular use. This is just a, a summary of what we were saying before. Only charge the car up to 100%, ideally if you're going to be driving the car within a few hours of the charge completing. Don't just charge it up and leave it like that for weeks or months. That's how you degrade the battery. Typically aim to use the car within the range of about 80 to 20% SOC for absolute maximum battery health care. Um, and then, you know, obviously the, the battery's full usable capacity there is there for a reason, but you know, don't go running it down to 0% just to see how how close you can get to running out and kind of coast up to a charge point and time it perfectly. You know, as, as fun as some people might find that, it's, it's better for the battery if you don't go below 20% on a regular basis. Um, now, the, as I say, this is purely an example of the best case uh, for like extremely good uh, battery care. Um, if you need to go up to 100%, go up to 100%. If you need to go down to zero, go down to zero. But ideally aim for what I've just shown you on the chart because that will maximize the lifespan and the health of your battery pack. And during periods of little or no use, do not store between 80 and 100% SOC. Ideally leave between 80 and 50. If it's between 50 and 20 SOC, uh, consider charging the car and avoid leaving it below 20% because that's asking for trouble. And if you're wanting more information on battery tech on the inner workings of it, of best practice for uh, um, you know, looking after an EV and more info on EVs in general, Plug Life Television is on YouTube. And also, as I said, the website, pluglifetelevision.co.uk. And I can also be found on the Twitters at 106UN if you have any queries. Thank you very much for your time. Ewan, thank you very much indeed for that. That was uh, really interesting. And I saw um, Mike Robertson reacted immediately saying, oh my God, I'm going out for a drive after this. So I'm sure there's a number of people who've got their cars um, in, in the wrong state of charge at the moment. That was really, really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, so I think the plan is that thank you. Are we now... Are we now going to take a sort of a, a short uh, break? If people want to grab a cup of coffee or, or a comfort break or something and then come out for questions. Is that the plan, uh, Jen? Yeah, that's the plan, yeah. Excellent. So um, we know who's here. We'll know who leaves. So, uh, but, so please don't rush off. Um, we would like to see you back So the, for some questions. Uh, the time now is 23 minutes past um, eight. We will start again um, at half past, if that's okay. All right. See, see you in a few minutes.
Right, hello everybody. Um, it's half past, so we'd like to kick off again with the second half. Um, uh, Ewan and Pete, are you both there? Could you unmute? See? Roger that. Okay, that's good. Um, hi. Ah, the real Ewan. There we go. We see, see you at last. That's great. Um, and uh, just before we uh, get stuck in, just a, a little uh, commercial uh, piece, really. Um, OREF is a membership organisation, so if you're not a member of OREF at the moment and you would like to be uh, become a member, uh, we'd love to see you. So please do think about joining um, OREF.co.uk. We'll put a link in um, to the bottom of the site. Um, and um, if you are, if you belong to one of the companies that's a member, then you better get membership anyway. But otherwise, we'd be delighted to see you. So, um, could we kick off with some questions? And um, Jen, I'll read them as I see them, but do feel free to, if you see people chipping in stuff and we're drifting off topic, if you uh, wouldn't mind keeping a weather eye on things, that'd be really helpful as well. Yeah. Um, so, uh, John Graham's uh, posed a question um, about, uh, does the same truth apply to mobile phone charging? I suppose that's uh, you and... Technically, yeah. Um, actually, mobile phones and consumer electronics in, in general, there's a few things that result in their uh, lifespan being considerably shorter than an EV's battery. Um, one of them is they don't have a proper thermal management system. Um, so they, you know, they, they do get hot and as a result, they degrade quicker. Um, your phone lives in your pocket, your laptop's processor gets up to 90 degrees C and the battery is quite close to that. Um, I, I have a, a, a couple of talks online where I've, I've kind of covered that in more detail. But um, another thing is that whilst electric vehicle manufacturers deliberately block off the top and bottom of the capacity, with consumer electronics, they try and eke every last second of runtime out of that battery. So what is 100% on your phone when it says it's fully charged is actually 100% of the cell uh, capacity. And in fact, um, I'm aware of some mobile phones that if the battery spec sheet says only charge me to 4.2 volts, they'll actually ramp that chemistry up to about 4.3 volts, which to be honest, gives you hardly any extra runtime, but it does mean that the battery dies quicker, which means you have to buy the next shiny model of phone that comes out. So it works out very well from a planned obsolescence perspective. But um, yeah, to answer your question, you know, if, if you can routinely take it up to like 80% and then down to 20% and then plug it back in, um, if you're keeping an eye on it, if you, you tend to charge it when you're sitting at your desk during the day, have it plugged into your laptop or whatever. Yeah, um, it's, that is a, it's a wise move, definitely, to follow that advice as well. Thanks, Ewan. Okay. Um, there was a question earlier from uh, Gareth uh, about whether there are tools other than leaf spy, in other words, uh, tools for other vehicles. Um, do you know much about that? We did have somebody trying to use a Zoe uh, piece of software for the Zoe, but I think they had a problem with the interface when we tried it on the last occasion. So, you know, do you know of any other bits of kit that are available? Yeah, the Zoe app um, or kind of sort of Canvas thing is is not that great from what I've heard. Um, I am aware of Tesla ones. In fact. Uh, let me just double check. Uh, I think because Nissan, in terms of the Leaf and the ENB200 and Tesla's plural, are without a doubt the most kind of reverse engineered cars on the market. Um, they, they have the most third party apps and the most uh, the most use as um, you know, their components have been cannibalized for like classic car retrofits and things. So people understand a lot about them. If you have a a Nissan Leaf or an EMV 200, your quid's in when it, try, when it comes to reading the CAN bus and getting the data off it. Likewise with a Tesla, um, I believe the one I've got is just called, yeah, Scan My Tesla. And uh, it's pretty comprehensive. Uh, so if, if you have a Tesla model, that's the one I would recommend. Other makes and models of EV to get that kind of CAN bus data being pulled off of the system, nothing springs to mind at the moment. Okay, no, that's fine. Thanks for that. Um, okay, um, just wonder if there are any other questions. Um, I, I I had one which I think you partly touched on, but I just wanted to test. The um, uh, Jonathan Porterfield has ground a groove in the A9, driving all these various uh, cars up here um, over time, um, and he. he 
was reckoning that he quite often he'd pick up a Nissan Leaf at an auction, and by the time he got it up to Orkney, having done a series of rapid charges, it would show better state of health. Would you expect that state of health to then drop away again as the temperature dropped off again, or is it is it just a like to be a transitory effect, or is it just a, an artifact of how Leaf Spy works? Um, it's not Leaf Spy. It's uh, you know, Leaf Spy is only displaying what it's managed to pull from the vehicle's CAN bus. So it's 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 not Leaf Spy kind of right. lying to you. It's it's the battery management system within the vehicle. Um, the the algorithm that's determining the state of health is or trying to predict it is a bit wishy washy. Uh, other manufacturers seem to be a bit more accurate than Nissan, to be fair. So yeah, um, I would not expect the state of health of a battery pack to, especially one with no active thermal management as per any Nissan Leaf ever built, I would not expect the state of health to improve over successive rapid charges over a very long journey. Um, I wouldn't expect the state of health to, to drop off as the pack cooled. Probably what would happen is it would take two or three kind of discharges then charging up on whether it's a rapid charger or whether it's a slow charger or whatever. Um, it would take two or three cycles for the the state of health algorithm to kind of recalibrate itself a bit and go, oh, right, maybe I'm playing with a bit less than I thought. It's As I said, it's having to make a best guess estimate um, mm. with a measurement of voltage, maybe doing some coulomb counting, you know, counting the charge in and out, but not going all the way down to zero, not going all the way up to 100. It is difficult to get right. So mm. I don't blame Nissan for it. But, um, you know, at least Nissan are, are very open in the way that they display the state of health on the, the Mark 1 Leaf. I do like that touch. But, uh, you know, if your SOH is high 80s to 100%, you've not really got that much to worry about. Mm, okay. There's a question from Stuart about um, if he said if the reported state of health is inaccurate, um, how best to buy a second-hand car? So, are there any? Well, other than going to Jonathan, of course. Um, are there any other particular things to look out for um, with the that one could do you know, to make sure yeah. you buy a decent one? I, despite having said, you know, they take the SOH with a pinch of salt. I do always ask for the the SOH reading from Leaf Spy. Um, there are a couple of things you want to check, uh, not only the number of bars on the dashboard, you ideally want to plug the um, the OBD uh, dongle in there and get Leaf Spy up. If the SOH is reported as kind of high 80s up to 100%, I'd be generally happy with that vehicle. But then again, there's the caveat of um, the mileage that that vehicle has done. For example, um, I was trying to source a 30 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf for a family member, and I went to see one privately a private sale and um the soh on that was kind of mid 80s uh mid to high 80s but the mileage on it was only about 20 odd thousand miles and when i arrived uh to view the car they had it plugged in and they, they unplugged it at that point and i did ask them they said yeah they tend to leave it plugged in so that's an example of a 30 kilowatt hour nissan leaf that has been degraded through the force feeding mm. Um, just constantly being charged up to 100%, um, which is, yeah, it's a shame because they are particularly, you know, uh, susceptible to that, the 30s. Um, something else that's worth checking on, on Leaf Spy that will give you a good indication of the health of the battery pack is the difference between the maximum cell voltage and the minimum cell voltage. When uh, the, easiest, the easiest kind of reference point for that is when the car is fully charged. Uh, having said you're trying to avoid fully charging it. But um, when the car is fully charged and balanced, I would expect a healthy battery pack to be well within 20 millivolts. And on, on Leaf Spy, it's the, you know, there's a big bold number, you know, 20 MV. That's your, your, your difference between VMAX and you know, the maximum uh, cell voltage and the minimum cell voltage within the pack. Okay. And, you know, if it's within 20 millivolts, that's pretty healthy. If it's above, 50 millivolts that's when you're like that's on the way out that's going to need a bit of servicing okay no, that's that's really heavy I, I did wonder what that number was so thank you for that that's good a couple of other questions come in um ian's post question ian do you want to come in and ask this or do you want to now scrap really, yeah, really i don't know yeah 
OK, so um, within the Reflex project, which is a project that's going on um, here, Ewan, um, we are intended to put some V2G charging, i.e. vehicle to grid, um, which is therefore reversible uh, charging. Um, are there any particular implications on the batteries, um, uh, particularly the battery health with doing this? Yeah, people would be concerned about the your battery health potentially being degraded quicker because it's being cycled more. But actually, my, my former colleagues at WMG did a very extensive two year study um, on automotive grade cells. It was basically what Tesla used in the Model S, um, Panasonic 18650s. They were temperature controlled as per you know, most EVs. And the, um, you know, they, they, they did uh, not only vehicular drive cycles on them, but vehicle to grid overnight uh, simulation on them. And they covered every environment in the world from Anchorage in Alaska to Cairo in Egypt. And they found across the board that the lifespan of those batteries that, uh, that underwent vehicle to grid as well as automotive you know, day to day drive cycles, that their lifespan was actually improved by about 10 percent. And the reason for this is likely because, well, there's a, cu a couple of reasons. One, vehicle to grid is going to entail a much lower load than peak throttle when driving and you know, accelerating and regenerative braking and rapid charging, you know, you're probably only going to be in single digit kilowatts and it's going to be a constant load. It's not going to be constantly fluctuating. It's going to be pretty flat. Uh, it's, it's going to be a very easy life for those cells. They prefer that kind of life. And as a result, it's really not harming them at all. Um, and on top of that, uh, because they're only going to be well, if you're using vehicle to grid, you know, you're, you're feeding power back to the house, you're feeding energy back to the, the house. And that means that you're taking it down from whatever it was charged up to, whether that was 80 percent, whether that was maybe 100 percent. And therefore, you're reducing the amount of time that the cells within the battery pack are left at a high voltage. And that reduces the, ca um, the, you know, the electrolyte degradation against the cathode. That's a scientific reason why vehicle to grid actually does help to improve the lifespan of EV batteries. And I, if I had the opportunity to have a vehicle to grid charger on the side of the house, my leaf is currently sitting there, um, you know, not doing very much these days. I would absolutely have that plugged in and I would be milking the agile octopus energy tariff for what it's worth. Now there's an endorsement. If ever I heard one, that's uh, really good. Okay. Thanks, Ewan. Um, a question from uh, Jeremy about the about charge uh, the high power chargers. So he said, I believe a few greater than hundred to two hundred kilowatt chargers have been stored in England. Um, what would be the impact on battery condition? So I assume obviously it's going to have to have a car that's able to take that. So, mm. um, but over time, what sort of difference might we expect to see? Any thoughts there? Yeah, the the answer is it's not going to be as scary as people think because this. You know, okay, 200 kilowatts is, in terms of absolute terms, it's, it's a big number. But in relative terms, with the vehicles that are going to be using them, it's actually not that high in amount. So what vehicles are going to be using them? They're probably going to have 85 to 100 kilowatt hour or more battery packs. And that means that the C rate that they're charged at is 2C. So your C rate is the charging power over the capacity of the, you know, the, the capacity in kilowatt hours of the cell. 200 kilowatts divided by 100 kilowatt pack, 2C. Um, and that means the inverse of that, it means it takes half an hour to charge the car fully from zero to 100% at that rate. So C rate's a really useful term uh, that we use within the electrochemistry world uh, when we're, descri we're describing how hard we're pushing a cell. The Mark I Nissan Leaf had a 24 kilowatt hour battery pack and it was charged on a 50 kilowatt rapid charger. Admittedly, it didn't quite pull 50 kilowatts most of the time, but uh, Nonetheless, if it did, that would be just over 2C. So it's actually not that bad. And then you look as well at 85 kilowatt hour Teslas charging at 120 kilowatts on a supercharger. That's what 1.3 to 1.5C off the top of my head. It's not that much. Um, so actually, it's not that bad. Plus, the vehicles that are going to be charging at 200 kilowatts or more are going to be the ones that have the liquid cooled battery packs that are keeping everything in tip top condition. Um, and, and they'll have the ability to preheat the battery pack and then you know, take that heat out of it, extract it straight away as soon as the charge is complete. I don't think we will see any long-term health impacts of using high-power rapid chargers 
given that most of us aren't going to be using high power rapid chargers that often. OK, you know, you'll have some people who are up and down the country the whole time, but even they shouldn't see too much of an impact um, because the cars, you know, the, the technology has come on so much um, that any automotive manufacturer who knows their way around a battery pack and a battery management system and a thermal management system is going to make sure that the car looks after itself properly. All right. Thanks, Ewan. Um, uh, one from Evelyn. Um, and please, if somebody's got a question for Pete, please do ask him a question because uh, Ewan's taking a kicking here. This is hardly fair as a guest, but anyway. Um, uh, Evelyn was asking, since the state of health is the best guess estimate for the limitations you've stated, is the state of charge of a battery also a best guessed, best guessed estimate? If the capacity of the battery is reducing, does that mean 80% charge uh, charge change over the lifetime of the battery? Um, yeah, SOC is absolutely uh, an estimate. Um, that said, it would take something pretty catastrophic for the vehicle to do a massive recalibration and go from saying, I've got 40% left in the battery to, oh, no, I need plugged in now. Um, so what the, the state of charge algorithm will be doing, as well as doing Coulomb counting, you know, counting the, um, the charge in versus charge out, and trying to roughly guess where it is. It's also going to be following the voltage of the cells, which is a really good indication of the state of charge, particularly with, with lithium ion, um, excluding lithium iron phosphate, which is a very different kind of lithium ion chemistry that's used a lot in electric buses, for example. Um, but what we find in our EVs today, it's it's not a linear discharge profile, but it's kind of like a, a sort of S shape. So, you know, you've you've it's pretty easy to tell if the cell is resting and there's no charge or discharge involved in it, it's pretty easy to tell what the state of charge is or estimate what the state of charge is from the voltage. And I think most EVs can do that to within two or 3% accuracy, which is why when a leaf hits about 10% SOC, the reading on the dashboard goes to dash dash. It's just like, it's low. You're on your own here, mate. I'm not guaranteeing anything. <laughs> they go ultra, ultra cautious on it. Yeah. And, um, you know, obviously Leaf Spy says, it's actually this, it's like 5%. But, you know, it, even that is a bit of a guess. So, um, yeah, it's, it's accurate enough for me to be happy with it. Yeah, okay. Um, that's, yeah. that's good. Um, I wonder if you had any observations about the stuff that uh, Pete showed and anything that whether you thought that what we were doing would be useful to keep doing this or whether we're barking at the wrong tree or anything different right. that you might suggest we do? Or? No, it's very useful info. Um, what's particularly interesting is the huge difference between the Japanese built and the UK built 24 kilowatt hour leaf, because when they started rolling them out of Sunderland, they also introduced the upgraded cell chemistry. The original one was not very heat resistant. So even in mild climates like uh, like Scotland, like Orkney, um, we were finding that uh, you know these these packs were degrading quicker. Uh, part of that might be to do with repeated rapid charging. Who knows? Because uh, there was no thermal management system to remove that heat. But we certainly don't see quite as profound an impact on the UK built 24 kilowatt hour leaf, which is still my favourite budget EV now. Um, so anyone who's looking for their, their first EV or a runabout, the 24 kilowatt hour leaf built in Sunderland is borderline indestructible and the batteries do last a long time. Um, Japanese built leafs, I always say, no, nah, because the, the chemistry was just nowhere near up to the task. That said, you can get a refurbed or brand new 24 kilowatt hour pack fitted to or retrofitted to a Japanese Mark I leaf. Um, and the old pack, even though it doesn't have that much capacity, could be taken out and used for grid storage and so on. So that has residual value. Um, I believe that there is a Hevra Hybrid and Electric Vehicle uh, Repair Association approved mechanic on Orkney. Um, so yeah. I don't know if, if they are capable of doing these pack retrofits, but I know that the Electron Garage in Glenrothes can do this. Um, and not only that, they can upgrade a 24 kilowatt hour leaf to a 30 or a 40 kilowatt hour pack. And the Japanese Mark One Leaf is actually quite good fun because uh, for the UK version, they remapped the throttle. With the Japanese one, you got the proper full whack. You get torque steer on it if you plant the throttle from the starting, <laughs> from, from a standing start. Very good fun to drive. So, yeah, what is actually quite a shrewd move. Buy a Japanese Mark One Leaf, haggle them down. It'll already be about five grand or something because the battery will be degraded. Haggle them down even more. Get a referred battery for about three grand, swap it in 
and um, you know, away you go. Anyway, Fantastic. that's a much longer answer than you were looking for. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> not, not at all. That is you, mm. Pete. One for you, I see. Um, about uh, from Ian about the the quarterly battery survey. You know, would a quarterly battery survey uh, give you uh, more information and start answering some of the questions you were posing? Yes, it would be. Um, I think what we have come up with a question about how you maintain your state of charge. Uh, I think that's an important uh, piece of information now that we need to start plugging into the database. So, I mean, it's it looks like from the, the uh, Z0 uh, leaves that, you know, people probably did charge to 100%, but immediately drilled away in the morning. Uh, and uh, there's been no degradation. Um, so it's really understanding, especially with the bigger uh, uh, batteries coming in, it's really how people are looking after their batteries and see yeah. really the information uh, 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 to, to the data. I, I mean, the END 200, I'm actually doing almost daily readings. Every time I move the END at the moment, I'm actually taking a reading. To, uh, and I'm seeing all the effects that uh, Ewan uh, has uh, described. I'm actually seeing coming through in the data. You know, if I if I if I go below uh, 40 percent, uh, you know, you can see that knock on a state I have just the tiniest knock, but you can see it happening quicker. And if it's over 80 percent, then you can see it uh, coming down a little bit quicker. Where if I keep it round about 60 percent. Uh, the, the state of health hardly touches uh, at all. So, uh, yeah, data, no problem. Uh, send it to, uh, I guess, uh, ev at oref.co.uk. Any information? Uh, if you've got your own leaf spy, take a take a reading, take a screen dump. Give us some information on how you you run your car, how you you know what's your daily habit uh, regarding the charging, and we should be able to confirm a lot of this. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Pete. Uh, just just on that, it's a point I would like to make about the database as well. If people have got EVs and would like to be willing to contribute data, basically what happens is every month you get a an email through from the system, um, uh, which is one of my, one of my bedroom just over there, um, and uh, the it asks you for the mileometer reading in your car, and also whether you've had any issues with the car, like um, windscreen wipers or tires or whatever it is um, and it you then just press send and it will then put it into the database we then run a report up every every month basically a little league table trying to show um, who who's doing what sort of mileage you just get a feel for where your car is in the in the stack the whole system's anonymized you get a user ID so it's not your it's not your vehicle registration it's not your name it's just an ID so you can see where you are in the table of other stuff and we're trying to see a way to um, uh, understand the total mileage is being done, which then gives us some indication of the scale of energy being consumed. Because as we were saying earlier that the cars are doing about 22, 24 miles a day on average, and the, and the LEAF is doing three and a half to let's say four miles a day, then that's about five and a half to six kilowatt hours of electricity per car per day being consumed. There are 10,000 um, cars in Orkney. So eventually when we get to electrify it, could we do that with what we got in the way of renewables? And the answer is yes. So so we can answer some of these questions, which are all very helpful. Um, I'm going to see if, if any other questions are coming in. Uh, Mark's just uh, thinning out, so he's um, uh, disappearing off. And I'm pleased to say that uh, we've still got uh, 25 people still on the call. So well done, everybody, for for um, for uh, staying staying on. I, I found it extremely interesting. This is the last knockings before I just uh, uh, close up. So any other questions? Last chance. Three, two, one. Right. OK, so um, I ju just leave it to me then to say my sincere thanks to you and, and to Pete uh, for all the work they've done that's uh, and shown us this evening and the work that's been going on, but also to the work that went on behind this uh, to make to the analysis and all the knowledge that's been gleaned over the years that's helping to drive forward this whole decarbonisation agenda. Um, Orkney's found itself in a very unusual uh, uh, position uh, where you know the, the eyes of the world are on us um, based on some fairly uh, 
simple steps that have been taken and partly that's all been working cooperatively together to both share our monthly mileages or get together and share our um, uh, the, the state of batteries uh, once a year which looks like we might be doing it more often as well um, i'm sure there's more that could be done um, and i'm sure we will be able to share more of it as, as this goes on um, to those people who did um, submit their vehicles um, i'm conscious i've not sent out the, the data which i'm going to do in the in the next week or so uh, so i'll let you have the information about your individual car we'll, we'll spit those back out again um, and also we'll uh, there'll be other talks uh, coming along which are always on the first tuesday of the month um, We'll be highlighting what the next talk's going to be. We've just got to clear it with the person who's offered to do it, um, and it'll be on the same sort of format. OREF is always interested in, in feedback on how the meetings go, and if you've got proposals for uh, ways to change this. So it really goes, oh, um, Stuart, I'm afraid you missed out on asking the question. I'm going to do the close up, and we may talk about this offline separately. Um, so I'm really just going to say my final thanks sincerely to you and, and to Pete. Uh, thank you to everybody who came along this evening. Um, we The recording will be available on the RF website in due course and we really hope you have a, a safe time, safe motoring and don't forget, don't let your state of charge go over 80%. You've been told, all right? Okay, good night everybody. Thanks, Em. Bye-bye. Yeah. And thank you so much for that. That was uh, that was really good. Um, oh, thank really, you. really appreciate it. And um, it was um, yeah, fast.